This is Akashwani. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on successful injection of ISRO's Aditya L1 in halo orbit to study Sun. The participants are Nigar Shaji, Project Director Aditya L1 mission and S. Rangabhashyam, Anchor. A warm welcome to the program Nigar Shaji to talk about this uh, landmark achievement uh, of our country, Aditya L1 mission finally going on to the orbit being placed in the right halo orbit for the benefit of our listeners tell us ma'am how big a landmark achievement is this for isro and for the entire country this you have heard about lagrangian points these are all the points it's like acts like a virtual planet and this any two big mass bodies like sun or earth moon or sun and jupiter sun mass like that we'll have five points where the gravitational pull of the both bodies will balance and we'll have a small gravitational effect but you can have a spacecraft around that point so l1 if you take it's an advantage that 24 by 7 our spacecraft will be able to observe the sun the point will be moving along with the earth so the, our the spacecraft also moves along with the earth and there are very few we are the fourth country to have a spacecraft around this orbit so it is first for india as well as isro so it's a first attempt where uh, because it's little tricky and it is a three dimensional orbit and we have the spacecraft to be balanced between these two pulls and maintain that orbit it's first of its and it's uh, mathematically very intensive calculations are required to have the spacecraft in this orbit that way it's a great success and great achievement for the country as well as isro and for first time and also presently it's a need of the hour that as the space weather is a upcoming field so we are uh, happy that we also could contribute to this field and have a better hold in the global forum ma'am tell us about the final maneuver obviously it's a very complicated complex series of maneuvers as you know after the launch we had a series of arbitrizing maneuvers to make it escape make the spacecraft escape from the gravitational pull of the earth and after that it travels almost 126 days in the heliocentric orbit and now the complexity on the algorithms what we use and precisely how we can inject it suppose if that is not done properly that will slips away and it may go towards the sun or towards the earth and again it is a lot of maneuvers are required and lot of fuel penalty will be there we have to uh, get back to this orbit so that way yesterday it's a precise injection that way it is very successful and it's a really a tricky and complex thing it is mathematically intensive algorithms are being used to calculate that exactly what velocity it should be imported to keep it in that orbit and ma'am as you said is it kind of geosynchronous the entire mission and the spacecraft will it move along with the earth as it revolves uh, no. on its axis no there no. is a difference geosynchronous is it moves around the earth in the same speed as the earth moves earth rotates on itself geosynchronous satellites moves around the earth but this orbit this particular halo orbit around l1 it doesn't move around the earth it's away from the earth but that point uh, that orbit moves along with the earth it is not around the earth that's the difference it is along the earth it moves and always will be seeing the sun and it doesn't have a, the beauty of this orbit is it will not have the eclipse because normally if you see the geosynchronous or polar sun synchronous orbit which revolves around the earth when it moves the earth comes the other side of the sun we'll have the eclipse and uh, it will not get the power here it is not so it's always viewing the sun it is along the earth it moves and for the benefit of our listeners also tell us what exactly is the halo orbit halo orbit is we say the god and all behind the, the head if you take krishna there is a halo behind that it yeah. is a circle behind a face so the orbit size or the pattern is like this that's why it is called halo it is around the point if you take face if you take a person and a halo behind the person means the face is the center and the halo is behind the it's like that the face is l1 point you assume and the halo is the what the halo you see so it will be glittering if the halo is because of the sun light it will be so bright and it will be like the halo pattern that uh, size is like a halo that's why it's called halo orbit ma'am let's also talk about the lagrange point which we have been hearing all these 
months now langrange one so obviously there are other points as well and uh, also that how far it is from earth it's uh, there are five points l1 l2 l3 l4 l5 so l1 is from the earth center it is 15 lakh kilometer that is the l1 point to a sun and l2 is other side of the earth that is away from the sun that is also of a distance of 15 million kilometer that point is l2 similarly there is l3 will come behind the sun that is also from the sun it is 1.5 15 lakh kilometer l4 and l5 will be like triangle all three points if the l1 and l2 if you take as a two points of the equilateral triangle the joining point the vertex point will be l3 and the inverse vertex will be the l4 so it's uh, pictorially if we represent will be easy to understand these are all the five points and l1 point is it is a vantage point to view the sun and l2 also we have you might have heard the james webb telescope which is launched by nasa that one it is put around l2 point l2 point normally we use for observing the deep space about other beyond solar system the milky way galaxies beyond the universe the all the systems in the universe to view it that is a nice point it's a good point at l2 to view it so these two points are only normally used and till now l1 and l2 is only used that l5 there is a plan because you will have a better advantage when the sun rotates you will be able to view the sun before the flares or uh, cme start ejecting towards uh, earth so that you can observe it little earlier so the warning system can be better if you place a spacecraft on l5 there are uh, nasa is planning to have one spacecraft at l5 ma'am we understand that aditya l1 mission among many other things would be also you know studying the solar flares and the mass ejections and other things tell us how real are these threats that we talk about and we get to read in media that solar flares could have a big impact on earth and also mass ejections could really impact earth in a very very negative manner actually solar flares is a high intense energy which is radiated uh, towards the entire solar system the flares if you see they will classify as based on the intensity of the flares they call it as a b m x like that the grading is there so x flares are highly intensive flares that can disturb our ionosphere and that way in turn the power lines or the electromagnetic communication things can also can be disturbed because of big flares recently also there is a one high intensity x class flare was as occurred and if you take the coronal masses these are all the streams of uh, ionized particles which is flashing out from the sun and it is uh, continuously it is coming that again depends on when the solar storm we say the intensity of this amount of ionized particles and the energy of the particles will be very high so there is a chance that it is more impact will be on the astronauts because they will be above the atmosphere and they will be doing the experiment and all for them the radiation will be intense and also to our spacecraft see india has around 50 to 60 spacecrafts around the earth so that also will be hampered their activities will be hampered this can even malfunction totally we can lose a spacecraft because of these flares and coronal mass injections and also very big storms means it can even puncture our magnetic because all these things we are protected because earth has a magnetic field which repels all these particles from attacking passing through inside the earth so if the storm storm is very very strong there are only in 18th century there is one big storm there the even the power north american power lines got disturbed and there was a power shutdown so that's a possibility and it is more common for the our space assets as well as the space astronauts is there a possibility of the spacecraft leaving the orbit as well no for that only we need to do the constant maneuvers and we will be continuously monitoring so that uh, give the proper maneuver so that it will not be leaving the orbit or fly towards the sun or fly towards the earth so we will be maneuvering and controlling the orbit we understand that uh, you know the mission lifetime is approximately 5 years what would happen to the payload after 5 years the design life is 5 years and it can go very well more than 5 years depends on the because now we have enough fuel so that is not limiting so if everything all the electronics everything is working fine it goes beyond 5 years 
But once the instruments starts uh, after uh, maybe 10 years, 15 years, the instruments, it starts small functioning or some of the subsystems of the spacecraft start small functioning. So it will slowly DRP or it will degrade and either it uh, fly towards the sun or it may enter into Earth. So that point of time we have can predict the orbit of the spacecraft at that point of time. Ma'am, has all the instruments uh, which are there on board have been switched on or will it take a couple of days or weeks for the instruments to be switched on and to start the scientific measurements? All the payloads are switched on and the initial functional verification is all uh, done. And there are, after uh, entering into the halo orbit, there are some activities to be done for some of the payloads. We need to correct the pointing and uh, the, those things. And also they need to do some of the calibration so that the science data, what it comes out of the instrument should be exactly useful. So such takes uh, months or uh, more than a month time to establish everything and uh, totally declare it as operational. Ma'am, we are expecting a lot of data scientific data but what kind of data can we expect to get see we have seven instruments and one is the solar coronal imaging instrument which images the corona and the coronal mass ejections so it's a image so you will get uh, images and with that we can see what is the source of how this process have been forming and how it is been getting formed or getting what is the intensity all those things we can study using that instrument and another instrument which is studying in the solar disk. So there it will be studying the flares uh, origin and the process of uh, flares. All those things on the center disk we are the, we, there are two images and we have another two instruments which will study the flares in the through x-rays. Actually as the high energy uh, in the high energy spectrum will be very well studied in the x-rays and gamma rays thing. So that we have and also we have three in-situ instruments which analyzes the solar wind that is the ionized particles which gets ejected from the sun will be in situ it will be analyzed at L1 point and these three instruments together can give a, a trigger of the incoming the solar wind or the, the particle solar storm that can give a trigger. So all the seven instruments will be studying the, all the major events of the sun. And uh, let's also talk about SUIT, that's the Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. What exactly yeah. does it do and what kind of data can we get from that? As I told, it is an imager that it images the sun in the ultraviolet region that is 200 to 400 nanometer. If they can see the sun spots, solar flares and they will be studying as soon as the solar flare as it originates, what's the velocity with which it travels. See, continuously we will taking the image. So we will know how the solar flare moves, how the intensity getting triggered. So in the UV region, we can study the origin and the process of we have a region of interest we can change based on the flares. So a particular portion of the sun we will be viewing intensely and how it travels, all those things we can understand. And what is the composition and that also can be understood. About this uh, landmark achievement, even Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji has lauded the efforts of uh, ISRO and uh, congratulated all the scientific community and scientists for this spectacular achievement. Ma'am, before we wind up our discussion, tell us we have tasted success in this crucial mission. What would be the implications for the future plans of our country and more specifically for ISRO's roadmap? The implication means because with the success of Chandrayaan 3 as well as Aditya, like we have got much more confidence and it's already the roadmaps are laid by the Prime Minister that by 2040 we should have a man on moon as well as by 2035 we should have a space station where uh, our astronauts will be doing the microgravity experiments. So these are all the roadmaps. Nigar Shaji, it's been a pleasure having you for this discussion. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on successful injection of ISRO's Aditya L1 in halo orbit to study sun. The participants were Nigar Shaji, Project Director, Aditya L1 mission and S. Rangabhashyam, Anchor. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of Akashwani. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. 
You may share your feedback about this program through email at airnsttalks at gmail.com or WhatsApp on 9289094044. ये आकाशवाणी दिल्ली का इंद्रप्रस्थ चैनल है